Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited to have you here today and we're really excited to have our guest Andy Finelli McGonigal because we're going to be talking about all things accounting. If you have joined us this week, part of this week, all of this week, we've had a really exciting time with a Nonprofit Power Week where we have spent every day with your part-time controller talking about a lot of different things and um, we don't do this very often we only do it a couple times of of the year where we take an entire week and we address a certain topic or you know direction and really dive deep into certain things and so we wanted to kind of finish up with an ask and answer um, because we just feel like it's such an important part of what we do and so again, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group is off today and she'll be back with us next week. Nonprofit Power Week is, is always so interesting and so amazing, but we are amazed by the amount of support we get for our sponsors to actually do this. Fundraising Academy at National University, Bloomerang, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Tech Talk, Nonprofit Nerd, and Staffing Boutique are the folks that support us. It's really important, Andy, and you, you probably know this because you and I have chatted about this, but our sponsors don't dictate our editorial direction. They have no voice in that. And so it's really something they step up and they trust us to talk about what it is we're, we want to talk about. And so our gratitude goes out to them. If you have missed or you want to review any of the almost 900 episodes, yes, hair on fire moment, 900 episodes, you can get to us through our app on any of our streaming broadcast platforms and also in podcast uh, form. Wherever you like to consume your content, we are there with you day in and day out. In fact, this episode will be uploaded and we'll talk about this a little bit later to the YPTC.com uh, website as well. So you can get to the information that we uh, discuss every day with ease and we will meet you where you are. Okay, Andy Finelli McGonigal. Hey, coming to us from the East Coast, which is fun. We were chatting about that in the Green Room Chatter. Vertical Specializations Director. Okay, what does that mean? So, um, good question. It's an interesting title, right? Uh, so, wow. you know, throughout the week, you've highlighted several of my colleagues, all with different specializations. So, we have, you know, over, I think we're over 1,400 clients now in th about 30 different areas of specialization in the nonprofit sector. So, wow. with that pool of talent and over 600 staff members working across all of those different specializations, we decided it was time to start gathering that talent and formalizing different groups, different teams um, to support everyone else who might not have familiarity with that sector. So my job is to go out and find that talent internally, form the teams, you know, who, who's who within YPTC, and put them, you know, form teams, put them together and start developing resources. And it also helps us talking externally at conferences and, you know, having a presence in these key areas. So Andy, if you were, let's say, somebody who works in the arts and cultural space, you wouldn't necessarily then be doing like uh, animal welfare, right? You'd be, are you saying that you kind of pull your talent more to what that nonprofit sector specialty is or more as a support function. So for example, you know, somebody might um, join YPTC and they're coming from, you know, my background was healthcare and education. Okay. Um, you know, if I was assigned a, an arts and culture client, I wouldn't, I would have a learning curve. Yeah, so what do you do? You call Justine and her team. You know, my colleague, Justine, who is heading up the arts and culture specialization. So it's re that's really the model. It's not that we're going to assign everyone clients within their specialty. It's just that this team exists as a resource in case you weren't exposed to it previously. 
I love it. Well, we love Justine because she's one of our <laughs> epic guests because she showed up. She was epic. <laughs> she was epic. Full witch's costume on Halloween, including green makeup. I mean, we, have, we can't get beyond that. We have enjoyed that so much. <laughs> The pressure is on because she has set the I know. <laughs> and we were like, oh, oh my gosh. And she had like cobwebs and she was amazing. I had a meeting with her that morning and I said, wow. She said, well, I'm on the nonprofit show. <laughs> <laughs> She's great. Well, everybody from uh, YPTC has been great and it's been a lot of fun. The very first person that I met from YPTC was uh, one of your founders, Eric Frank, and he really change the trajectory of what we do at the American Nonprofit Academy and the Nonprofit Show um, in, in some wonderful ways. And so it's been a, an amazing part of our life and our growth uh, to be to be aligned with you. So, well, we welcome you here, but more importantly, we need to get you answering some of these questions and they are not going to be super easy. So let's start off with the first one. Does remote accounting make things more or less safe? We're all worried about security. We talk about this, it's on the news. What say you about this? So I think um, not, not necessarily. I think it could go either way. I've walked certainly walked into some very unsafe, unsecure physical locations, you know, as an associate or as a manager walking into a client and you know, checks are laying out, signed, you know, anybody could grab a check and walk away with it. So that's certainly not safe or secure. Um, so kind of in a way, I feel like remote accounting has forced us more into the digital age mm -hmm. where we're utilizing tools such as bill.com and other bill pay functions right. where you don't have those checks laying around. That's just one example. Um, and you've got a, a secure platform that you have, you know, user access defined, you have approval flow workflows. Mm -hmm. So you're ensuring that somebody is approving those invoices and it's really hard to circumvent. You can't just walk across the hall and say, sign this check, I need it right now. So from that perspective, um, you know, I feel like it's actually remote forced us to be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing that's been trickier is the fact that if you're remote, you have to look at what that remote setting is. Are you in an office or are people working from home? So in an office, you can oh. secure the remote setting because you're in a controlled environment, right. but working from home, it's variable. Where are the people who are doing the accounting? Who is, you know, what is their home setup? So really shifting and ensuring that that home setup is secure, document storage is secure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are people leaving files laying around for their family to look at confidential information? So mm -hmm. it's just different considerations. You know, it's, it's interesting, too, because think about, you know, especially in the pandemic, folks that had a quote unquote family computer and then all of a sudden, you know, you're on working. And then when you're done, your kids are on or your spouse. I mean, I, I can see where that can make things a little dicey and easier to penetrate um, something that really needs to be more secure. Absolutely. So, yeah, if people are looking at a remote solution, they need to look at how is this organization handling that aspect? How are they, you know, what is their security? Mm -hmm. Do you find that your nonprofit clients are even asking you about that? I mean, do they understand to that extent? Because it's something that is some <clears throat> of a new discussion in the last. I, I think, years. yeah, it's really new. And, you know, we shifted quickly during the pandemic and nobody had time to think about it. <laughs> uh, some of, you know, some of our larger clients ask, they used to ask before, what, what's your office security setup? You know, what, what how can you ensure? Um, but, you know, I think a lot of our clients are, are maybe just getting to that point where they're going to start thinking about it, but we don't hear a lot about it. It's something people should ask. It's, it's fascinating because you just, um, and we're going to talk more about this, but remote accounting is such a, a new concept in, in the practice and the implementation of it. It 
it's probably filling our brains with a lot of other questions and concerns and security we're, we're kind of it's it's there but maybe it's not as high um, really interesting answer well let's go into the next question because this one is um, kind of a it's, it's a tricky question and it goes it, it goes like this innovation in accounting is a trend it, you know in that part you could say we've been doing accounting in the same way for a long long time and now it's changed up is this only going to be something that next gen accountants are are doing or do we have to like and i hate to say it do we have to wait out that older generation of accountants before we can start really adapting to this digital phase I mean, we shouldn't have to. I feel like accounting, you know, you said accounting has been this pretty much the same for a long time. It actually goes back to double entry. The double entry accounting system goes back to like the 1400s with the Venetian merchants. Wow. So, I mean, that right there, though, was innovation, right? They took yeah. a big step from stone tablets and, and handwritten tallies that maybe weren't consistent. So, that was innovation in the 1400s and maybe it was a slower growth curve, but now with technology, we're having a faster growth curve and we, we all have to keep up with that curve. And I, I feel like, um, you know, people talked about that earlier in the week as well, is that we have to follow technology or we're not keeping up as an industry, as, uh, as a profession. Mm -hmm. um, I think the real difference is, and, and here's another thing that hasn't changed, is that the innovation is the second step to the actual transactional work. So the transactional accounting is what hasn't changed. But the innovation, okay. the ability to be transformational, you think about a CFO level role, that's that's where you're, you're taking that information and what are you doing with it? That's where you have the opportunity um, to do many, many different things. You can forecast, you can you can utilize those tools like um, AI and Power BI and, and present it in a much more user-friendly way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really, I love that you talked about this because at, at the core of it, we still are trying to achieve the same things, navigate, you know, the flow of money and investment and management of, of that financial part of our world, um, how we do it is different and, and, and how we navigate through that. Um, it's really an interesting piece of the pie to me because when I talk to nonprofits, you can tell the folks that are like, I can get that information super fast. And then others who like dread going to the accounting and finance department, asking for information, knowing that it might take weeks to get it. And to me, when I hear that, um, and especially I would say, Andy, around uh, donor inquiries or grant applications, award applications, things of that nature, um, shoot, what a difference. I mean, you can tell the ecosystem of that nonprofit who's, who's more current with their technology and who is not. It's shocking. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely shocking. Well, let's, uh, we're, we're not pushing out the old accountants yet, but <laughs> let's go on to our next question because it's kind of an interesting one. And it's one of those things that I'm going to ask you to, if you will, get out your crystal ball in some ways. Is remote accounting less or more than on-site accounting? And when we say less or more, we're talking about a plethora of things. So let's start with costs because that's, what you know that's a good starting point so um yeah i mean cost you can I, I think you do with uh with remote accounting you do have the opportunity to be more uh inexpensive and it just depends on how you are structuring your remote setup right you can send it to sort of a warehouse of accountants where people are just working on bits and pieces and you don't really have an assigned person that's the most cost-effective remote accounting. Mm -hmm. Is it the best accounting? And so if you want to think about more or less, that's sort of less in another way. It's, you know, more cost-effective, but less personable. Yeah. You don't have that relationship. You don't have that connection. So 
Um, you could then, you know, change it to sort of a hybrid model or even a, a remote model where you have an assigned person. You're going to have less flexibility with staffing. So you're, you're still managing it with one staff member assigned to certain clients, um, but then you're building in that personal element. So it's, again, sort of a continuum. Um, and then I would say probably the next step would be uh, hybrid. Mm -hmm. You're starting to get into on-site. And I think at this point, you're really not really seeing a big cost difference. And even on-site, you're, you're still, I think hybrid's probably the best solution because you have the flexibility to work multiple clients in a day, whereas on-site, you're kind of limited to one thing a day. Right. Well, you know, and I'm thinking of, I mean, never has it been said that a nonprofit had too much space right and so i'm thinking about like office space and oh. just you know like the technology and and you know more people more technology more yeah. phones, more this that you know and it, it you you have to factor that in because those are real costs you can't just say you know at the end of the day it doesn't matter because we have to provide for whoever is in our physical space that's right. true. Absolutely. That's, that's yeah. One of those things. Um, the other thing I'd love you, you brought this up and that is, you know, the hybrid model. Could you express a little bit more about what that might look like? And I'm curious, does this really follow the budget um, amount of an organization? Like over a certain amount, are you seeing that this is where you have to go under a certain amount, you know, annual revenue? What does that look like to you? Um, I don't know that it, if every, if, if, you know, all those other factors we talked about earlier, like document storage, proper systems, you know, if that's all in place, it, it doesn't make a big difference, but, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> that no, that's okay. I'm just thinking about like, can, or should we align this to what our our annual budget is so like if, you, if you're like an under 10 million dollars don't worry about hybrid but if you go to 20 million you need to really be in that or, or does that even matter no i don't think it does i think if the systems are in place that the advantage to hybrid is that okay you don't have to provide all that infrastructure of right. a full staff working there but okay. you have the ability for those people or person to come you know to come in as needed for critical meetings, okay. uh, board presentations. Okay. So that you have that, you develop that relationship, you can do some of those critical things in person and really just add a little bit more value by that personal relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting too, I would say a part of me, knowing the YPTC folks as I've gotten to know them, um, it seems to me like if you send, if you have the ability to go on site, you might find that there's an alignment that gets created that you hadn't thought of. That, you know, the YPTC member or whomever comes in and is like, hey, you should talk to, you know, my friend, Derek Dreyer, because he does government funding and he might be somebody who, if you've never thought about this or you're having problems, you could talk to or, you know what I'm saying, you know, with your data viz team. And it, I, I'm yeah. wondering if that ever happens, that it's just organic. You're exactly. You mentioned, you know, the water cooler conversations, and that's exactly what you miss by not being on site. Yeah. Uh, when you're, you know, you have great interaction on Zoom. You can schedule meetings. You can schedule lunch. But you don't have that organic Oh, you know, you're brainstorming together ideas yeah. are usually more limited in your time. You've got a scheduled one hour Zoom session mm -hmm. and you're getting your work done and you're getting off the call. Right, right. Because you're mo you're moving on. It's it's people are lined right. up. Really interesting. Well, let's move on to our, our next question, because this is one of those things that, again, dealing with some new technology and new workflows and understanding how to think in a different way, dare I say, because of this process. How long does it take to adopt a remote accounting procedures? Because um, there's gotta be a learning curve. 
For sure. Um, and, and that really, it depends, but I think the pandemic was an excellent example of how you can do it really quickly. We were forced, everyone was forced to pivot. And yes, there was a learning curve, but it became a priority that that learning curve became a priority. We had no other choice. Um, normally, yeah, people could be resistant to it. You'd have to retrain. I don't want to use Zoom. I don't want to use Bill.com. I want to do it my way. And you have to talk to people and hold their hand. You have to have training sessions where we were just, you know, from from what we saw, it was just, okay, this is this is where we're going. Pandemic, this is what we have to do. So I think that taught us that you can do it very quickly. You get past some of those human resistance factors mm -hmm. that are natural mm -hmm. and you can go very quickly. You know, it seems to me that this conversation is gonna be one of those things where we're like, oh yeah, that's right. We didn't always do it this way. Or, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll get, if I maybe describe it as a new reality, like this is how we do it. I mean, you, you started off with, going into the accounting departments and the checks are there they're don't use the printer i've got checks in it you know right i'm i'm dating myself no absolutely that was such an issue <laughs> such an issue oh my god such an issue i mean checks are expensive and then you'd be like who who you know sent this you know through and you'd be like ah now i gotta re-rack everything and yeah i mean it's such an interesting thing to even think back to that. I mean, to me, that seems like the dark ages, but right. it really wasn't. But it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't, it wasn't. And so, you know, that's one of the, the beautiful things about the nonprofit sector in many ways. Um, I think we can change. Um, we just, necess we don't necessarily change when it comes to our business part. I think we're great on programming and we're great on identifying a problem and, you know, switching in the hubs and let's get going. But on the business side, we've been woefully behind in this sector. It's, it's been, it's really kind of an interesting and sad and sad thing. And I think that Jarrett and I talk about this a lot, um, our observations about how other sectors ramped up very quickly to, to, embrace change in the nonprofit sector has been um, kind of behind. Um, this next question is so different, but it's one of those questions that I get asked a lot um, about, <coughs> pardon me, especially with my board training and my board engagement. How do we get a remote accounting firm to communicate with our board? It seems to me, Andy, more and more boards are asking somebody from the accounting finance de department to come in during that board meeting and give a presentation. And it's not just the audit group. I mean, that's something else, but you know, no money, no mission, getting down to the brass tacks during that meeting. How does this function occur when we're talking about remote accounting services? Um, again, this is something that was, you know, people had to pivot during the pandemic. The board meetings themselves were on Zoom. So the, point. whoever you were bringing in to present on accounting, whether they were normally on site or not, um, they attended via Zoom. So um, you could always attend via Zoom. Okay. Um, I think the key, before I get started, I think the key is though, there should be a knowledgeable representative from the accounting and finance function present at the board meetings. Okay, good. Answer those detailed questions to, you know, instead of it's it's great if the treasurer can can present and has the knowledge, but, but I, I really think there's so much more value to having that extra person present in some way, shape, or form, whether it's in person or on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Um and so that's really the, you know, that's how they they should they should communicate by being present mm -hmm. and whether that's virtual or in person is, is, doesn't matter. Um, I, I have, you know, we do see many, many uh, remote operations that, that take the stance that they, they communicate with the board by handing them a packet. 
<laughs> with communication, great. That is that is certainly a form of communication, but that is not the should. That's not how they should communicate. Right. It's just a piece of it. Right. It's the right. first step. Are you seeing more and more uh, nonprofits using board portals? where, where uh, information is being uploaded, you know, is because you brought up that word and it just, you know, pinged my brain about the, the board packet, which, oh my gosh, yeah, the board packet was always such a big deal. Right. <laughs> More of these board portals whereby all the information is uploaded and it's there, you just have to be responsible and have a responsible enough team to go through it. And I would argue the same thing with the board packet. But. I was going to say, I mean, I haven't seen the board portal, but I think it's it's the same thing. You can hand some on a stack of papers or you can put it in a portal and that board has to take the responsibility to read it and do their their due diligence and, and you know, their fiscal responsibility. Yeah, yeah. It's a really important thing. And, and I feel like, uh, and, and maybe this is kind of one of my last questions to you, but I feel like a lot of board members don't truly recognize the fiduciary responsibility that they have, that their name, address, and, and information goes on that 990 that is filed with the federal government. Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 something that that I see a lot. You know, mm -hmm. board members they they want to they want to uh, participate. They want to have their say. They want to have that. <laughs> title they want to tell their friends <laughs> and they, they also genuinely want to do good by the organization um, but they don't realize the fiduciary responsibility piece they really don't a lot of times and it is it is huge and in some cases you know especially when it comes to like payroll taxes they could be personally liable mm -hmm. yeah i i know a lot in our board training i always call that the chris and kiss and cry portion of our trainings because you know I can look out into a sea of people um, or be talking with somebody and you can just see it on their face that they really had no idea and that it's quite frightening it's quite frightening because um, you know not understanding or not knowing is is no defense you know the reality is you you are responsible for that whether you understand it or not and uh, so it is one of those things that uh, we need to make sure we do a better job. I don't care if you're in accounting or finance, any type of leadership, uh, that those board members need to know that before they ever come on. And I think that's, you know, another advantage to having that presence at the board meetings, because if they didn't read it, you have someone there walking through and talking about it and making yeah. sure if they didn't read it, they at least they at least heard it. Yeah. Well, we've heard you. You have been great. Andy Finelli McGonagall. It's really been a pleasure um, to, to be able to get your wisdom. Um, you know, being in the hot seat at the end of the week is always interesting because so many things have been flying by us. And, and our week with YPTC um, has been very interesting and, and quite varied. We've talked about a lot of different things. And so to kind of have somebody come back I'm at the end of the week and frame it up for us has been really great. Andy Finelli McGonagall, Vertical Specialization Director, coming to us from where a place where they have fall, <laughs> which blows my mind because we're in the West. We don't get too much fall here, but in the East, you're getting fall. And so, Andy, this has been just lovely to have you be um, a part of this discussion. My you know, friend. we've it's been... A, a lot, of, like I said, a lot of information and in just our conversation with Andy, so many different ways to think about things. But one of the great ways that you can help you, your organization and yourself is to go to the YPTC.com website. Whether you're a client of theirs or not, they have a tremendous amount of uh, free and accessible information um, from webinars to blog posts, uh, all sorts of things, great articles about their uh, team members and the history. They're celebrating 30 years of business in our country. And so it's a really cool thing to be able to get back with them to see what they're doing. So check out YPTC.com. Um, wow, this week we've had an amazing group of women talking about different things. Again, we want to make sure that we give our gratitude to Alicia Eastwald, Susan Wagner, 
of course, Andy Finelli, McGonagall, Teresa Henderson, Harriet Hatsy Cutshaw, who I was one of the first people beside Eric that I met years ago. Uh, and, and so that was fun to reconnect uh, with her. I also want to give a thank, a shout out of gratitude to um, the amazing Gerilyn Dressler, who I personally work with. Um, our team works with so that we can get all of this together because this is a heavy lift. Probably why we only do this a couple times a year, right, Andy? Because this is a big, big thing to put all this forward. Nonprofit Power Week, again, sponsored by Fundraising Academy at National University, Bloomerang, your part-time controller, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are our partners in these amazing discussions. Coming up on 900 episodes um, in October, which blows my mind, um, and they have been on this journey with us, so we want to make sure we say thank you. Andy, you did really well being in the hot seat, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> it, you know, it's not easy. I Before we got started in the, in the green room, I'll, I'll witness to this. I'm like, now, Andy, no pressure, but you're speaking for the entire sector here today. <laughs> You did great. I loved what you had to say, and I think it really helped a lot of folks. And so we say thank you, thank you for being a part of this. We really do. Hey, everybody, we like to end every episode of The Nonprofit Show with this mantra. And as we end up a very busy week, it's even more important to go into the weekend with our, our saying. And we it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here.